Welcome to Guernica Edition's Poets Sans Cassette Interview Series, a collaborative project of Canadian poets and independent presses. Guernica Editions is based in Hamilton, situated upon the traditional and unceded territories of the Erie, Neutral, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Mississaugas. Today, Conyer Clayton and Jenna Lynn Albert will be in conversation and will read from their recent poetry collections, and they have a couple poems they wrote just for us. Conyer Clayton is an Ottawa-based writer, musician, editor, and gymnastics coach. Her debut full-length collection of poetry is We Shed Our Skin Like Dynamite, published in 2020 by Guernica Editions. She has released two albums and seven chapbooks, most recently, Sprawl, The Time It Took Us to Forget, published by Collusion Books in 2020 and written in collaboration with Manahil Bandaguala. She won the Capilano Review's 2019 Robin Blazer Poetry Prize, ARC Poetry Magazine's 2017 Diana Brebner Prize, and is a member of the Creative Collective 7, whose debut chapbook is forthcoming with Collusion Books in Spring 2021. Jenilyn Albert is a queer Acadian poet and graduate of the University of New Brunswick's Creative Writing Program. Her poetry has appeared in numerous literary magazines such as the Malahat Review, The Puritan, and Riddle Fence. Albert lives in Fredericton, New Brunswick, where she is a member of the Fiddleheads editorial board and a co-host of the Elm and Ampersand Poetry Podcast. Her debut collection of poetry, Beck and Call, was published with Nightwood Editions in September 2018. She is currently finishing up a two-year term as the City of Fredericton's Poet Laureate. Welcome, Conyer and Jenilyn. Hi, Jenilyn. <laughs> Hi, Connie. Would you prefer I call you Connie or Conyer? I honestly don't really care. Either or is fine. Uh... I kind of, I don't know, maybe Conyer, because only people in the literary world call me Conyer. <laughs> Everyone else calls me Connie, so it feels more like, mm. yeah. <laughs> and you like, are you Jenna Lynn, like both names? It's funny, in a literary world, that's what I'm known as, so I'm, okay. I'm cool with that. <laughs> okay, we'll both go with our like lit world name then, sure. <laughs> <laughs> My first question for you is what were your biggest takeaways from your stint as a uh, Fredericton's Poet Laureate? It's such a big question. I know. <laughs> I love it. So my, my laureateship is coming to an end. It's actually a really timely question. I'm finished at the end of January. Okay. So my biggest takeaway, it's one that really stuck with me. I worked on this um, chat book project with a local festival called Flourish. And we made these beautiful uh, postcard chat books. So it came in a little bundle and you could mail the postcards um, and kind of hold on to the ones you love or share them with your friends. It was a really cool initiative, especially with uh, COVID. We found it was nice to be able to kind of send it out into the world in a different way. Mm -hmm. And uh, we put out a call for artists to submit. And one of these submissions really, really stuck with me. It was by a local poet whose name is Jamie Kitts. And they submitted this really beautiful poem about how they hadn't come out when their grandmother was still living, but they felt that she would have accepted them for who they were because their grandmother would make these cookies that had none of the regular ingredients. So they couldn't use eggs or flour or milk and if their grandmother could accept their dietary restrictions, they viewed it as their grandmother could accept them for who they are. And getting submissions like that and being able to, you know, uplift emerging writers and support them and give them that platform, it, it was really the most rewarding part of the job. Um, and I, I was able to share that poem at a city council meeting and, uh, it, it was just one of those those moments. I think those are the ones that'll stick. Uh, the ways that I was able to kind of see this, this new generation of poets thrive and help them in the ways that I had the platform to do at the time. It, it was pretty incredible. And of, of course there were the, the city hall controversies, um, which sharing a poem about Black Lives Matter and uh, your poem, which 
that's why I was so excited to be able to, to meet with you today. It, uh, you know, it, it kind of came full circle where here we are being able to chat about, about it. But uh, it, it was really a rewarding position and it really made me realize the kind of platform that poets have. And I think uh, for, for many of us, we also saw Amanda Gorman's poem go, go viral after the Biden inauguration. So I think it's, it's given me faith in the power that poetry has. So my first question for you is really general, and it was one kind of, it's been jumping around my brain. How have current events like political turmoil or the pandemic kind of played into your poetry, if at all? I say if at all, because not everyone has felt the ability to keep creating art during these tumultuous times. So I kind of leave it as an open-ended question. <laughs> mm -hmm. In a very practical sense, the pandemic um, made me start doing a bunch of collaborations with people that I don't think I would have done. Maybe I would have, but they were very timely, but I don't know that I would have done them had uh, the pandemic not happened. Like my um, most recent chat book with Manaha Bandikwala uh, called Sprawl, The Time I Took Us to Forget, just came out with Collusion Books. And that started in March, 2020, um, right at the start of the first shutdown. And Manaha is a really, really good friend of mine. And I don't know, we missed each other. And, we, and so we just started uh, writing poems to each other back and forth and it became this whole thing. And, um, and I'm just really, I'm really grateful I got to do that um, because I think I was really craving a way to connect with people in, in a very isolating way period and to kind of maintain a community. Um, yeah, so that's one way. And then also a creative collective that I'm part of called Seven formed around the same time near the end of March. Um, and Helen Robertson uh, is kind of like the founder of that. And, and she had contacted a, a bunch of us, um, myself, Manah Hill, Ellen Chang Richardson, Helen Robertson herself, Chris Johnson, Margaret LaPierre, and Nina Jane Dristic. And so we all started writing poems together um, very kind of continuously. And it was a nice way to, because like what you spoke to in your question, creating was a little difficult during the first part of the pandemic for me, and I think for a lot of people. So it was a way to kind of keep some creativity flowing without as much pressure, because you know you can contribute two lines to something. So that's in a very real way, uh, it impacted my writing in collaboration. But then for like my solo work, I think that I, I would write about like political stuff, but more just as it directly related to kind of like my personal experience, um, just like abortion or addiction and, and the way that those things are politicized. But with like, all the like colonial violence with like the Mi'kmaq fishermen in Nova Scotia and uh, Black Lives Matters protests, I found myself uh, writing about my kind of settler privilege and my white privilege quite a lot during this last year, uh, which is not something I'd ever um, written about before. Um, so that, that definitely spurred a change in my subject matter, yeah. So true. And I love how you're talking about collaboration, especially how it takes pressure off. I think it, it can be really daunting to try and tackle a new creative project when it feels like so much is different than how it used to be. And having that ability to kind of play with others, if that yeah. makes sense, it, it's really liberating. It is. Play is a good way to think of it because it, you know, I think it's sometimes uh, there's a lot of, we put more pressure on ourselves than I think we put on other people. <laughs> so yeah. when you, when you ensconce yourself into a group, uh, you, you kind of get a little bit more free, I think. And that freedom felt really, and continues to feel very, very nice because we continue to, to work as a group. So, yeah. Well, that's so nice to hear. <laughs> I was reading through, uh, Beck and Call, and a lot of the poems there kind of reference childhood experience. And I 
thought that that was really interesting. And it was bringing up this kind of nostalgia for me, but I was wondering how the idea of nostalgia comes into play for your subject matter. And if nostalgia is even the right way of thinking about it at all. I think nostalgia is, is really accurate uh, for, for those poems that are in the collection. And it, it's really funny to me how, how memory played in. We have kind of this running joke where when I was writing the poems, I'd often send them to my family, especially any that were about childhood memories. And my mom and dad would correct me on things and they'd say, oh, that's not quite how it happened. So it, it runs into this, this human issue of how, how memory actually functions and how some things are misremembered like my sister has this incredible memory. She can remember things from when we were ch children that she'll say, and I'll be like, I do not remember that whatsoever. So I think it's it's nostalgia. It's playing around with these like communal memories where I'd remember something a certain way and check in with my family to say like, hey, this is what I remember what actually happened. And growing up, my, my family has always been very tight knit. And those memories were always ones that stuck out. And uh, yeah, childhood memories, I, I think they're, they're kind of one of those areas of opportunity where you can write things that are autobiographical and really play with them. And there's things about childhood that I feel like you can talk about without it being taboo. Um, there's one poem in the collection where I talk about kind of discovering what masturbation was as a child and the, you know, good old Catholic shame around that. And it's just, it's some of those topics you can explore in ways that maybe if you were to address the same subject matter as an adult, it, it can be difficult to do. So I found a lot of freedom in, in kind of invoking those childhood memories, even the ones that are embarrassing. Yeah, I like that. And I like um, poetry, I feel kind of lends itself to diving into embarrassment a little bit because you aren't so rigidly um, under the under the banner of truth necessarily. So it almost creates a little bit of distance somehow, even if it is true, there's like this like kind of a veil. Uh, so I, I really like that. And I found your poems also just like funny. Your childhood ones I just found like really funny. And I think that humor and poetry is uh, underrated. <laughs> it's funny that you say that. I, I didn't think I, I was like a funny person until I started writing poetry and saw that, you know, at readings, you'd actually get a laugh, which you you hope for that. If you're writing something that has some humor to it, you, you cross your fingers that the crowd will, you know, react the way you'd like them to. But uh, it, it was something I kind of discovered about myself. And I think that kind of came with growing up in a big Acadian family. Humor was a way that we dealt with many of our issues. And it's still a way, even during this pandemic that I find where we're handling it the best we can. And sometimes it's cracking a joke. I found while reading, we shed our skin like dynamite that there was this really captivating tension between the urban industrial world and that of the natural world that permeates all these poems. Could you speak to this recurring theme that appeared in the collection? Yeah, um, so I think that part of that comes from the fact that I have always lived in cities. Um, not big cities though. I've always lived in like mid-size, like my, where I'm from Louisville, Kentucky, it's like about a million people. So it's really similar to Ottawa. It actually feels, uh, I think that's why I feel at home in Ottawa. Um, it's a similar vibe and size. And the smallest place I've ever lived was in Halifax for a few years. So, but so I've always kind of been in these sort of cities, sort of green space, this kind of in between. Um, and I'm, but I've always kind of felt really drawn to wanting a bit more isolation um, and like a little bit more like wildness. Um, but most of the, the spaces, the again, in quotes, nature spaces that I have had access to most of my life have been these kind of curated and tamed little plots of nature. Like, oh, here's this nice park. And it's like, oh, this is a wild part of the park, but there's still a path there. And, you know, here's the, the Daniel Boone National Forest, but it's 
still only an hour away or whatever. So I think I have always kind of craved a little bit uh, more like to get lost a little bit, but then also have this fear, <laughs> which is probably why I don't actually just move out into the wilderness. <laughs> um, but I think that like on a philosophical level, I that what I'm often trying to do in my work is to kind of show that this divide that even I have in my thinking and we all have is very arbitrary and that like the nature in cities is like equal to the nature in non-cities and that it's all really like the same thing and I think that the hierarchy is a bit false and it, it kind of contributes to our sense of of separating ourselves from the natural world because we are the natural world and um, so I think that that tension is kind of just me trying to always remember that but then always forgetting and then trying to remember again and, and kind of going back and forth all the time yeah I know what you mean Fredericton is kind of similar where it's it's kind of considered a big city for New Brunswick, but it's it's not particularly huge. And there's there's that kind of you know balance between the the green space and this industrial area. And uh, same goes for St. John. It was very similar, where we had this big beautiful harbor, and then you had pulp mills and big shipping containers coming in and out. And it's a very industrialized city. Yeah, and I just find that that dichotomy really interesting, um, but also the kind of like, how it really is just a kind of a false binary. Um, yeah, so I'm always, I think about that all the, a lot. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna read a poem from my book. We should have seen like dynamite. I picked this one uh, mainly because of the last stanza. It feels uh, timely for right now. Bone bed. She finds comfort in a collarbone. Angles fit for smaller jaws. Draws a drop of warmth like sap from ax wounds. Fast paced in a pine tree. Shoulders ribboned to the trunk, half off the thinly padded floor. She set it out for you, neatly, mirrors and chalked nostrils flaring. It's the very shawl she wears to cover a thin white dress, stitched with longing. I find crystals to this day, but only on my hands, instead of in a star or a galaxy too big to slip a ring over during a waltz out of time, too well rehearsed. There are nights when we shut the curtains to deter the sunrise, pile on blankets like pie crust. We're melted in the middle, elbows crispy, cooking in collectivity, marinating madness. I love that poem. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm one of those awful poets that dog ears. I dog ears right. everything. Yeah. And that, that's one of the poems I dog ears. Oh, <laughs> you're not awful for dog earing. It's just like, it's love. It's love. It means it was well loved and read. Yeah. Team dog ear for sure. <laughs> I'm reading a poem from my debut collection, Beck and Cull. And uh, this is one of the heavier poems in the collection, but it's one that I, I keep coming back to. Um, I wrote it for my sister. And since I'd written the poem, I experienced what the subject matter is myself. And going back to it, it really took on a different meaning for me. Miscarried. The line is the faintest red. Watered down so we have to squint at it like we're interpreting fine art at a museum. You can feel the artist's pain. Our eyes focus and refocus on the test you're not sure that you want to pass. Neither of us ever tested well, even when we knew the material, studied. It's best to take it first thing, mom said. So you rolled your bones out of bed, tying your hair back in a French braid and pressing your hands to your abdomen, expecting to feel something there, 
something moving around like the sea monkeys we bought from the little shop of science when we were small, floating aimlessly in fogged water. If only fetuses were as dispensable. Still you cried when the last of our brown shrimp dried, died. I wait outside the bathroom door and listen to the trickle of morning urine, the cat meowing for water at the tap. Another plastic stick, pearl white capped and set on the counter to steep. You've started to date each one with a Sharpie. There should have been something to say, but neither of us could think of it. So we sat with our backs to the tub while the tap water drip, dripped. It's faint again and you call the clinic. This early, we know what it might mean. This early, we should know better than to look up names with no eyes or fingers or teeth to connect them to. Only a plastic stick and me and you in the washroom every morning this week. Me and you, Pinteresting nursery designs, maternity wear and DIY mobiles, me and you. I'd asked a friend to teach me how to knit a stuffed animal. Decided to do a cat, a simple pattern for beginners. It wasn't like the kid would care. An hour's drive separate, separated us the day of the call. A receptionist informing you, matter of factly, that you miscarried and that your body would expel the fetus and not to be alarmed by any bleeding and to avoid reading the clotted contents of the toilet bowl like tea leaves. To call if there were any complications at all. That this is all completely, entirely normal. You call me as the kettle whistles as I'm pouring boiling water over coffee grinds in a French press. And something's not right as you take a deep breath, in with the good, out with the bad, and tell me that you're gutted. Wow. Oh, the, the, the deep breath on the phone has like a very personal resonance to me. And then like, oh man, when the brine, I don't know, something about those brine shrimp in that poem, it like, is it just, yeah, that's really a powerful poem. Yeah, and like I said, it was when I, I had written it. And uh, I think there's those poems you, you try to write forever. And that one had kind of percolated for a year. I've been trying to write one about my experience with miscarriage. And uh, it feels like that same kind of effort where the poem's not ready to be written yet. So I've kind of been learning that sometimes poems take time and it's okay if it doesn't come naturally or effortlessly at first. Yeah. Yeah, that's 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 a hard lesson to learn though, especially if you're someone who uh writing is a cathartic experience because you you want that. And I don't know if that's you or not, but that, that's something that I experience. So when you do have to wait it, it feels it's hard. Yeah. Yeah, I I'm a strong supporter of like writing as therapy and mm -hmm. it can really have that healing quality to it. So when you want to be able to have that like you said, catharsis, and it's just not coming, it can be really frustrating. So it's it's also okay to like acknowledge sometimes those feelings need some time to, to register. And it, it might not ever be a poem and that's okay too. Very true. Yeah, sometimes not everything is meant to go on the page. <laughs> <laughs> One of the salient features I noticed in your poetry that really struck me is how you write the body. Um, particularly feelings of disembodiment. The poem, I deal with it immediately came to mind when I was thinking up this question. And this, this is less a question, more an opportunity to kind of discuss um, what you kind of go to when you're writing the body in these unique ways. It's funny because I, um, I don't, a lot of people talk to me, ask me about like embodiment and the body in my work, but I think to me, I, I, I don't necessarily like think about that I'm going to write about the body. I, I think I'm just very, very rooted in my bodily experience um, and always have been. And I think part of that is because I've uh, was like a competitive gymnast and athlete and I'm still involved as, in, as a professional gymnastics coach. So I think that like a lot of my experience of the world is about my body moving in space and, and being in tune with like how my body feels and injuries and things like that. So I think that it's, that's just how I move through the world is with a heightened awareness of my body, which can be a bad thing sometimes. Um, so I think when I experience kind of a sense of disembodiment, um, 
that that is a very notable uh, thing for me. And usually that's coming from an experience of dissociation uh, because of some sort of trauma. And uh, specifically with uh, the poem you talked about, I deal with it. Um, that poem is about um, kind of a dissociative trauma response from sexual assault and rape and how those experiences kind of shaped my own relationship to my sexuality and to my body as a sexual body, you know? Um, so I think that learning to be re-embodied um, and part of that process was through writing about, like we were just talking about catharsis, was through finally letting myself write about um, those experiences um, as kind of a way of reclaiming some agency over my body um, and getting kind of rooted again. So, so I guess, yeah, the, that's a long answer, but the short answer is just that, that I, I just kind of, I don't necessarily approach it in any certain way. I think it is just me writing my, uh, my lived experience of feeling my body almost too much sometimes. And sometimes it's overwhelming. I'm like, I would like to, not that I would like to be disembodied, but there's, there's almost sometimes a reprieve of feeling like you're like leaving the physical behind a little bit, but that's really hard for me to do, I think. I always think it's interesting when someone reads something into your poetry that you aren't conscious of as the writer. And it, it happens the, the longer you write, I find there's always a new interpretation or, or new way that people are like, oh, you're really good at this. And it's not something you were conscious about. So it's always that kind of dilemma of, oh, do I go along with it? Like, oh yes, I'm such a genius. I intended to do that. Or do you kind of fess up and say like, oh, I, that just happened naturally. It, it wasn't an intentional thing. It kind of just came into being. Yeah, I I think that happens a lot. And I'm like, I'm usually like, I I don't know. <laughs> it just kind of happened. And then after you're aware of it, it's that's a, the one of the fun parts. After you're aware of it and you can start identifying it, even when you're drafting. That's when I think craft comes along because you can start, you can start fine-tuning the things that you naturally do. Yeah. Uh, something that I really like about your writing, and this kind of goes back to, I didn't know you were going to ask me this question earlier about uh, the nature and industrial in my work, but that your work also really inhabits like the natural world. There's a lot of like names of animals and specific plant names, um, but it doesn't over idealize it in this kind of like pastoral way, um, which is I really like and appreciate. So I just want to know what your relationship to kind of nature and eco poetry in general is. I've always had a fascination with poetry almost having this documentary style perspective about it. Um, I'm a child of the 90s. I grew up on nature documentaries with David Attenborough. And there was always this kind of like, oh, look, this beautiful image of like a a fox hunting and there was always that bittersweet moment of like well it's it's hunting another cute little creature to eat and take home to its babies to feed and help them thrive so I always had this fascination with writing things in a way that felt authentic and truthful rather than you know romanticizing these these things and I think it's it's kind of become a a feature that's been associated with a lot of Canadian poets and maritime poets, especially this kind of approaching things with this, this is how it is. Um, we're going to tell the truth of it, the reality of it, rather than making it seem prettier than what, what it can be. Um, so I, I always had that kind of fascination, especially with animals. And I won't lie, I watched so many David Attenborough documentaries while I was writing. Um, and it always got really into those, those specific details like plant names and, and what certain animals kind of do to, to survive or thrive. Or um, as, as we know, some animals like koalas, things that they, they've adapted to do that are kind of detrimental to their species as a whole. Um, so it's just kind of been a fascination. And I think we, we also as poets kind of go through these phases of interest. Um, so I found like, I've been really getting into flora and fauna lately. 
um, in my poetry and I'm seeing kind of themes of that come up. So it's it's funny to, to recognize kind of the headspace we were in when we were writing a certain group of poems. Um, but I think animals, no matter what, find a way into, into my work. In like 50 years, they're gonna be like, this was Jenilyn Albert's koala phase. This was her. <laughs> But I love that. I'm also a 90s child and the all about the nature documentaries. I love it. So I'm going to fess up and say I have the hardest time writing about the pandemic. I'd written a poem for city council earlier on that was called self assessment. And it was kind of a, a focus on mental health, which I think is something that a lot of people are struggling with during the pandemic. And after writing that poem, there were some things that happened over this last almost year that I realized I, I was really struggling to write about. So this is a guzzle in progress. Um, and it kind of focuses on those harder things about the pandemic um, or less appropriate to share at city council things about the pandemic that, uh, that really stuck with me. And it's an untitled poem. During lockdown, I inherited my nanny's fern, her green thumb, turned the apartment full garden, learned quickly that each houseplant must quarantine before joining the rest of the nursery. Health authorities recommend the use of glory holes, remind us to stimulate more than just the economy. It took a pandemic for me to finally get an IUD in a province dead set on enforcing pregnancy. Light is a feather, stiff as a board. We resort to childhood tricks in order to drag ourselves out of bed. I've lost the ability to tell time, out of office, out of body, out of reach. And that's my poem in progress. I love that. Um, my poem is uh, called Secondhand. We invest in a new reading lamp and a gliding chair we find on Kijiji. We drive to the suburbs the day before the shutdown, leave the car with masks already on. The couple opens their door and we all stand several feet from the frame. They don't help us load the furniture and for once this is a kindness, a courtesy, appreciated. They say, we have a baby car seat too if you need it assuming we'd only be buying this chair for a nursery. I laugh and say, no, the chair is just for us and keep to myself the thought, I can't even plan for next week right now. How could I think to have a child? <laughs> yeah, I, so I, this has been, I'm a big planner. So everything being up in the air has been hard for that part of me. Um, but it's yeah, I definitely. so true. And it's yeah. funny to see that reproductive theme go through both our poems. I know. <laughs> and the like getting new belongings, the kind of nesting, you got the plant. Yeah, yeah I was, yeah, it's interesting. I think there's some universal <laughs> experiences going on <laughs> for everyone right now. Oh, and it's, it's so true. And I don't know about the case where you are, but in New Brunswick, one of my first anxieties with the pandemic was I do not want to wind up pregnant. Um, yes. <laughs> not in this city, not in this province. I do not want to wind up pregnant here, um, especially with, as I know you've heard, our uh, only private abortion clinic closed. Um, our buses aren't running between cities anymore. You can only get an abortion in a different health zone and you're not allowed to travel to them right now. So I went and got myself an IUD at the start of a global pandemic um, and was determined to do so. And my partner and I had a lot of jokes about what are you going to do if it winds up being the apocalypse? How are you going to get that IUD out in five years? And I said, I'll worry about it then. Right now, I'm not worried about children and that is good enough. Um, so I, I think it's kind of funny that those those themes and uh, those reproductive anxieties are kind of also triggered during these. Yeah. Um, well, and I also like, I do want to have kids and like I, but I was thinking, but this whole thing has made, and I also have an IUD and I was, but I was like, 
how long is this going to go on? So, and then again, my planning part is like, so if my plan was to have kids by this time, then what is this doing to that plan? And obviously that's have to kind of throw everything out the window right now. But um, yeah, it's a whole different level of reproductive anxiety added by the pandemic. It's intense. And just the planning anxiety. I think uh, we all like to know what our daily life is going to look like. And we don't even know if the province is going to be locked down tomorrow, which is the the reality people have now, where the most planning we're doing is planning how much cans of soup we're going to need if we're forced to stay in the apartment for two weeks. Yeah. (laughs) And it's like, I, I can't control the next two years but I can buy a reading lamp that's what I can do right now so I'm doing it so there is a whole lot of kind of I'm sorry if this is an awkward question but there's a lot of mixing of like food and sex in a lot of your poems um and I really love the kind of just like brutal frankness and realism about the way that you incorporate both those subjects and I really don't have like a a question I just wanted you to talk about this so I'm just bringing it up when I was seeing this in advance I was so happy you asked it because I think it's fun sex can be awkward and gross and uncomfortable and it can also be amazing and fun and I think there's a freedom in being able to describe sex kind of as it is, um, especially some of the, the more gross aspects of it. Um, I, I also think food is just one of those areas that you can pull these phenomenal images from. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna get even grosser here. There's probably a lot of folks that know of Dr. Pimple Popper. And one of the things she tends to do is compare like these cysts or pimples to like, oh, this looks like mashed potatoes or something like that. So there's like this visceral recognition in food that almost anyone can identify with. Maybe you have not had this sexual experience um, or the experience of having a cyst popped, but you have had the experience most likely of having mashed potatoes. So I just thought it was really fun. And uh, I, I also enjoy food. Uh, who doesn't? I also like have a weird fondness for kind of just gross things. I'm one of those person that if someone's like, oh, I got hurt and here's a picture and everyone's like, no, and I'm like, please show me. I want to see this. So I don't know if it's a poet thing, but there's this like morbid fascination with all these wild subject matter. Like mm-hmm. medical things totally fascinate me. I love it. We're two kindred spirits here. <laughs> Stuart Ross described these poems as deeply personal. And reading through We Shed Our Skin Like Dynamite, I was struck by the vulnerability that your poems allow when discussing difficult topics like abortion and addiction. Do you find it difficult to write about these highly personal, often autobiographical issues? I think it kind of depends on the content. So um, I was I was reflecting on this and I think that the degree of shame that is uh that surrounds an issue largely determines uh the ease with which I'm able to to write um so things like uh like writing about abortion I have no shame um surrounding my abortion my abortion was an extremely empowering positive experience for me and so I have apps it's very personal but I there's no shame I am very very happy to write about that um things like like when I wrote uh, We Shutter Skin Like Dynamite, the bo- the the poems that are about addiction in that, I wrote those before I uh, got sober. And so I think I was not as aware <laughs> of what was going on. Like I always kind of knew, you kind you always know, but you, but I wasn't filled with as much shame about it because I was kind of actively having to defend, uh, defend it all the time. Um, so I think I wrote about that very freely because I wasn't ashamed at that point. Now, when I'm writing about addiction and, uh, and recovery, writing about recovery, I find hard, um, because I do feel some shame now when I look back. Um, and I think writing about, um, writing about sexual assault is 
really hard because there is a lot of uh, kind of shame associated with that as well. But those are the subjects that feel the most important to write about. And it's again, going back to our earlier portion of our conversation um, about sometimes they're just not ready yet. Um, like I didn't write directly about uh, my experience of, of rape from when I was a teenager until a couple years ago, like over a decade later. And, um, but I needed to, but I just couldn't until then. And yeah, so who knows when things come up. Um, so it's, it's hard sometimes, but it's not hard other times. Yeah. That's definitely something I identify with as well. I, I find some poems, they're, they're subjects that made people feel we should be ashamed of and we have no issue writing about them. Um, for example, like I wrote a lot of these poems when I was newly single out of a very long-term relationship. It was kind of exploring who I was and what I wanted in a partner and what I wanted in sex and felt no shame writing about those poems. But there's some poems that, that take time um, and some poems that it's, it's okay to write for yourself too. Um, they don't necessarily need to be published or put out into the world or shared. Um, and that's something I'm a big advocate for too. Like, yeah, I love that. I think that that's so important. And I actually started, um, kind of mindfully sometimes writing two versions of poems, like the poem that is for me. And then the poem that is, if I feel like it's something about a subject I want to share that I will completely edit into almost a different poem. So they're, they're like, sisters but different and one is the private version and I, I found that that's been a very um helpful practice um because I I also you talk about the autobiographical aspect in in your question and I think sometimes I would put this pressure on myself that I like have to tell the truth mm -hmm. in this poem especially if it's about like a, a heavy subject matter like yeah. and things like, like I owe it to myself to tell the absolute capital T truth about this. But sometimes, sometimes that's actually not what's gonna be helpful to me um, or to anyone. <laughs> so so you you have to just make those choices, yeah. And I think there's there's freedom in that too, being able to say, you, you know, it's a poem. There, there might be some things that are autobiographical. Um, and it was kind of a joke I threw a few poems in there that were definitely not about me whatsoever. They were just fun, creative poems. There was one I wrote about the family dog having to go get a surgery. And he had eaten all these items that represented what was going on in the family. I never had a dog. So I always had like a few poems to fall back on and be like, oh, it's not all true. It's not all autobiographical. So I had that little like defense. <laughs> you never know. You can't you assume. <laughs> It's like, I am not the speaker. Uh, so my last question for you is a kind of a general one, um, but how do your politics and activism kind of come into play in your creative process? I really love this question. And it's it's really apt question about this collection in particular. When I was writing my master's thesis that became Beck and Call, I was just entering grad school and kind of figuring out a lot about myself, where my politics stood, um, kind of getting away from an uber conservative city and having that kind of freedom to think for myself and really open my worldview. I, I was disillusioned to a lot of things. And one, one in particular that really influenced the collection and pushed me to start writing things that dealt with politics and subject matter that might make people uncomfortable. Um, there was an instant at another university in their creative writing program where a professor was sexually assaulting students. And the blowback that was coming towards the students, um, especially by major players in the literary community, it really affected me. And opened my eyes to what this industry could be. And I determined that I'd stop writing poetry that was only going to be pretty and only going to address, you know, kind of just sentimental things and really focus on writing poetry that dealt into topics like sexual assault um, and in politics. And I think the, the more I've grown as a poet, um, especially over my laureateship, the more political um, and, and broad my subject matter has become. 
Um, I think poetry is a really great medium for addressing these topics. Um, as a poet laureate, I really kind of had my eyes open to just how much power those poems could have. And it, it really taught me, you know, there, there's a place for these topics in poetry. You're allowed to write about these topics. And it's, it's one more way to, to be an advocate. It's, it's not always physically being at a rally. Sometimes there is power in the art, in, in the things that you're doing that, that can get those messages across, like we saw with Amanda Gorman, like we see with poets like Denez Smith and, and poets here in Canada, like Jay Simpson, who are really bringing attention to these political issues um, in, in the, the work they're creating. I, I always tried to write about things that were important to me, regardless of them being political. And uh, I think now more than ever, I've come to appreciate that I have the privilege and freedom and platform to be able to do that and really want to focus on, on trying to give that same opportunity to, to other writers. Many of your poems in this collection and in projects such as your collaborative album with Nathaniel Lacoche, If the River Stood Still, make use of sound and music in ways that give life to poetry beyond the page. What role does music play in the creation of your poems? Thanks for asking this question. Um, I love music and music is, um, like such a big part of my life and my creative process. Um, I think to speak just about, about like my poetry as outside of music that like rhythm and musicality are, are probably one of the two most important aspects of my work. And they're the things that I kind of edit for the most. Um, and even in prose, um, I have a bunch of prose that I'm working on in prose poetry and the rhythm of those is really crucial, I think. Um, I kind of feel like music and poetry are like are kin and maybe they're even like, <laughs> like identical twins, but they're just wearing like a different colored shirt or something. Uh, <laughs> uh, so that's how I, I see it. And, um, my album with Nathaniel, If the River Stood Still, was a really kind of transformative experience for me because I've always been involved in music, um, playing piano and taking music theory courses in high school, but I was so intimidated by it and never felt like I was any good at it. But I, I just wanted to be in the music world, but I just, I could never find my, my in. So um, making that album with Nathaniel, he plays music and, and my poetry is over it. And, but it was a very like collaborative writing process. And it kind of just gave me confidence that like, oh, I do have a musical since and so since then i've i've been making my own music and um just like just music and also doing some stuff for like music and poetry like uh, minahel and i our chat book we we released like a whole uh video poem and a score where i play some music and nathaniel plays some music and liam burke plays music and um and i just really think that music and poetry have the ability just to enhance one another so, so acutely um, and something to learn from each other as well. Yeah. I, I love that you play with music and poetry and I find myself, I, I always have music on while I'm writing. Music weaves its way into the poems, whether it's through sound or rhythm or pulling inspiration from certain songs or artists. So I, I just loved to see the project you had done with Nathaniel. And I, I really noticed your focus on sound and rhythm. And I think there's, there's kind of this, sometimes it's this view that music and poetry should be kept separate. And maybe it's because Bob Dylan was getting poetry. <laughs> I don't know. But I, I always found them, like you said, they're, they're kind of like twin sisters. They, yeah. they really work together. And there's beauty in, in being able to put poetry to music or vice versa. Yeah, I really feel like they are one and the same when it comes down to it. They're kind of just different vehicles, um, but they're drawing from the same well with similar instruments as well. So I, I 
I don't see that separation as being necessary. <laughs> yeah. I love when things are able to kind of work across genres. And, yeah, me too. And not be one dimensional, which I, I really appreciate about your poetry, where it has this new accessibility. And I, I like to view things from, could this be a new way that someone discovers this, this art, this craft? And music can be a way that people can kind of jump into poetry. And again, vice, vice versa. I also think that there's a um, a way in which that music can also there's a divide that between like spoken word poetry and page poetry and it's kind of mm -hmm. like I, and I think <laughs> I think that I I I find that music can is kind of a way to maybe bridge between those because like if I had to define myself I guess I would say I have a page poet but I think that like the performance aspect is so important and the, the sound is so important and I think that memorizing your poems is also really helpful um, and that's something that a lot of spoken word artists do that not a ton of page poets do and anyway I just I see music as kind of a bridge between those two worlds as well um, yeah 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 and it it reminds me of like the collaboration we were talking about earlier. I've had the opportunity over my career to read poetry with music accompanying it. And there's some freedom that comes with that. There's, mm -hmm. it, it adds life to it in a different way. It's a new experience, which I always think is so unique in the same way that when you hear a poet read the poem versus only reading it on the page, it's a different new experience that you're able to take in. It, it added this new component to it and I really appreciated that and had fun with it. It's, it's not always an opportunity that you are presented that you can, you know, read poetry with someone playing the cello or your friend on the guitar behind you who, when I was in my undergraduate, we had done a coffee shop and he just asked every poet before they read, what, what's the vibe of your poem? And just thinking <laughs> about poetry in that way was, was really fun. This was awesome. I know, but I had so much fun talking to you. This was really nice. I feel very like comfortable and just, yeah. Thank you for watching Poet Senka Set Interview Series with Guernica Editions. Stay tuned for our next interview next week. Don't forget to like and subscribe.